Then let's go immediately to the focus of the topic, and um, I would go to the question for all of you. But let's start with you, Ursula. Circularity. What does it mean for you and for your company, circularity in packaging? So I'm going to take a couple of steps back, Lali, and talk a little bit about um, the journey we're in. I think because circularity, it means one of the solutions we can bring to the table to reduce our carbon footprint in the end. So I'll talk about three, three things quickly. The first one is about how we are driving uh, not only sustainability, but our ESG agenda at the Agile, if, if you will, and then I'll come back to sustainability and, and circularity, I promise. So um, at the Agile, we have a commitment um, in line with the 25 sustainability development goals from the United Nations. So I think that many companies uh, like ours in, in the FMCG world and in many other industries are moving towards creating goals that are aligned to the development goals that the United Nations have established. In the case of the Agile, that journey is called Spirit of Progress. It's our internal ESG frame. This ESG frame is created against 25 specific goals. <laughs> uh, if I go down towards sustainability rather than inclusion and diversity, etc., cetera, um, in, within sustainability, we have goals obviously very close to um, getting to net, net zero carbon emissions. As you know, the commitment from, from many countries around the world is to get to net zero by 2050. In the case of the Agile, we have made a statement that we want to become net zero by 2030. So the clock is ticking. Uh, when we said this, it was 2020. Uh, 10 years seemed like a long time ahead of us. Now it's six years and like eight months or so. So, you know, it, it's, it's a fast moving conversation. To, to equip our senior leaders with that, about 300 people, including myself, we have been um, really exposed and, and actually it's been a, a phenomenal program. We've done an Oxford um, certification alongside the University of Oxford, the Said Business School, and that's equipping us to really embrace um, our sustainability journey on different, on different forefronts, um, at different levels of the organization and within different functions holistically. So obviously we have experts looking at water reduction, um, regenerative ag agriculture and many other things. And from a marketing standpoint, we are much closer to the consumer. Mm -hmm. And obviously circularity plays a very important role in what we can do. So that's statement number one. When we talk about circularity, obviously there is what it means for me and then what it means for the agile. I think, uh, interestingly, I was reflecting on that uh, a, a while ago when Lali and I started talking about the opportunity of joining you here today. And uh, I'm sure you all remember, I, I mean, I, again, I'm from Mexico, we stated that already, but, uh, but I'm sure it was the same in many countries. Mm -hmm. um, when, we were, when we were younger, most of us, you would go and buy Coca-Cola or other things in glass containers that then you will bring back. And there was a deposit to that. And that was actually true for, for soft drinks. That was actually true for beer. I see a lot of people nodding. And that was circularity at its best. Hmm. And then we went nuts as, a, as, a, as humanity and we started kind of creating all these alternatives which at the time seemed super interesting, right? Uh, but maybe are no, no longer there. So, Circularity means that we can build the best solutions mm -hmm. to deliver products and reutilize re um, the containers, in our case, to bring liquids. And something very important that might be a little bit invisible is that we not only sell to consumers, but we also sell to the on-trade, bars and restaurants. Around the world, the, the on-trade business, for example, for Diageo represents about 35 to 40% of the total volume that, that goes through the on-trade bars and restaurants. In the case of Southern Europe, which is the, the markets I'm currently responsible for, 70% of our volume goes through the on-trade. So solutions to the on-trade are also very important. Mm. So if I'm going to leave you with, with kind of one big thought from this is, you might all be very familiar with the four P's of marketing, like product and price, etc. But I would introduce four new ones, if you allow me, which is or are 
purpose at the core of all that we're doing because it's no longer only about can we reduce the adhesives of the production of the bottle? Mm -hmm. Can we change the, the amount of glass or can we reduce the amount of glass? Or can we use it with more eco-friendly glass? It's not about that. It's really about the purpose behind that. And purpose is very important. The second would be people. In the end, we need to listen to consumers. So I wouldn't be doing a fair representation of the marketing function here with you today if I was not to talk about people. What do consumers want? What are, want, what are consumers looking for in terms of solutions? So purpose, people. The third would obviously be the planet, right? And, and that would be, to me, the, the third P. So um, the, the planet. And last but not least, performance. Large corporations, we need to maintain not only a cost-efficient um, value chain, mm -hmm. but also ways in which we can deliver added value to consumers because the competition out there is, is fierce. So in summary, when we talk about cir circularity, Lali, it's truly an enabler of that journey in being much more purpose-centric, better for people, better for the planet, and delivering on performance. Thank you. Really great insight. And I take one of your comments to ask still for what does it mean for a designer circularity. You were speaking about the people. Yes. How do you consider then in the circularity for packaging the people? Well, it's, it's the big thing to be managed, uh, honestly, because uh, we are in the point uh, in which uh, we are thinking of uh, about a problem to solve a problem, because designing is to solve a problem, that now has a more holistic approach, more things to be considered. But uh, at the end, uh, our, our project uh, is evaluated by the clients, by the producer, but also for any customer that is uh, considering to pay that product and take it to home. So, so we are all the time managing that balance in which uh, we, we, we need to be beautiful, we need to be emotional, we need to be, it's not about losing anything. So less impact is not losing emotion, not losing premiumness sometimes, or not losing anything. We need to gain things, not losing the rest of the, uh, that is important. So for us uh, as designer, that's our main goal, how we can keep the, the surprise, the feeling, the, the, the emotion, and the desire of the people who is paying by the product, but at the same time producing less impact and being more sustainable. And this is our main thing in our minds, and the, the main thing to be solved in the future. Good. Uh, Any then, comment? And then for yeah. us, it's an exercise of responsibility. We, we, we yes. make a lot of decisions. We can push the, the client to make better decisions about the, yes. the sustainability. And, and our must, we, we must to, to keep informed, to, to, to join in this kind of panel mm. to, to make better decisions for our client. It's, mm. uh, uh, it's our, it's at the end of the day, it's, it's our job. No. Uh, sure. Sure. Mm. Then you speak about clients. Uh, Torben, you are surely having designers to, to help you uh, on, on the design and on the design for recycling on the Circularity, what does it mean, circularity, for you, Torben, and, and for Arla? Yeah, maybe more for Arla. Uh, I think, uh, to roll back a bit, uh, when we talk about sustainability in the company, uh, packaging is actually just a very little thing. Yeah. We are a dairy production uh, uh, with cows uh, that fart, and uh, production use a lot of energy. Uh, so, so actually, packaging is a minor piece of the total footprint. Mm. However, packaging is in the top seven essentials in the company. Wow. Why is that? Wow. Well, that's because of the consumers. Mm. Uh, because everybody among, everybody in the room here has a relation to packaging. Mm. And we are actually the, the buying force. And that's why it's so important, even though the footprint is small in the bigger picture. True. So if I look into the three steps, uh, we have the consumers. And they want what they call sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very broad term. term. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, that's more or less up to us to really understand. So we need to get really under the skin of the consumers to meet their, their needs. Uh, then we have the retailers, which are our customers, and uh, they just expect us to deliver. Um, okay. So, so we, again, we have to uh, provide them with what the consumers want. Mm 
Yeah. So, so for us, it's, it's uh, quite a difficult journey to get up all, all the way out there to really understand what mm -hmm. it is and what it means to people. And then, as a third step, we have the, we have the legislation. Uh, that's a new wave coming in, or multiple waves coming in from all sides, mm -hmm. uh, because we have, like in Europe, we have European legislations, we have regional legislation, we have new taxes, we have the extended producer responsibility, we have a lot of things coming into us. And that just makes the journey very, very complex. So when we talk about circularity, as you said, uh, it's a kind of this, a solution to the problem <laughs> or a way to discuss uh, the, uh, the solution. Um, I see circularity as a situation without waste. Uh, we don't need, we, if we can avoid any kind of waste in the whole chain, that is to me circularity. That's very simple. Surely I agree. Thank you. <laughs> You said retailer. Let's take uh, the retailer part from the circularity. What does it mean for, for you, Anna? For us, it means to rethink our processes in a way to use less resources and also our products, and we act mainly on two bases. The products, where we, we have the, the ugly products and to give them a new life into a sellable product. We have several projects with, where we partner with producers mm -hmm. to um, we uh, give a new life to ugly apples. We developed a, a new vinegar, for instance, and also on packaging. We have commitments. We, we, develop, we are part of the packaging commitment for Portugal, where in two years, all of our packaging for the own brand products needs to be 100% recyclable, with at least 30% of recycled content. So we act on our packaging requirements. We built a packaging uh, requirements to share with suppliers. We are acting on pushing the market forward in order to increase recyclability. And also, too, we have several projects in terms of collecting in our stores uh, used plastic to be able to go for the upcycling, not to collect the same type of, of product and to give them a new life in the same type of, of material. So we, basically, it's product and packaging and uh, stimulating the consumer also to recycle more to reuse more, and we also work on in terms of eco-design and communication. Thank you. To end with the same question, and I'm really interested to listen from Marika and CCL's standpoint, what does it mean for you, circularity in packaging? Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for introducing the topic of relativity, <laughs> because I was at a, a sustainable uh, packaging summit a couple of days ago, and they uh, had like asked consumers, you know, what they thought, and they had stated, most of them stated that they thought that packaging was responsible for 50% of the overall CO2 emissions in the world. Like, whereas, yeah, where it's at like, you know, like a one digit, low one digit figures. So this is like one thing, the misconception, if you then drill it down to like the label, mm -hmm. is like even less. Mm -hmm. So, um, so for us, you know, this is like always important and we also like educate our sales teams, you know, not to like panic overall because, you know, we are talking about a small but an important part of the packaging. So for CCL, um, let's say circularity has like three different pillars. First of all, it was important to make sure that we are part of the right organizations. As you said, Ellen MacArthur, um, the SPTIs, um, all of these organizations uh, we joined as well and we also set, set goals and we are working towards them. Um, this was like the, the one thing um, yeah. to be like uh, clear, you know, invest into software to be able to measure our CO2 and what our responsibility is. Then moving on to uh, the products, which is like the most important part. And then uh, this was where we made sure that our product portfolio is in line with like all the design for recycling guidelines and that we made sure that we had like a solution for every packaging material because we don't really care if we put it on a plastic bottle, if we put it on a glass bottle or if we put it on an aluminum container, for example. Um, it's very important that the material mix is according to design for recycling and I think we have like uh, with the good work of Reciclas, for example, and APR in the US in the last couple of years, we do have like a lot of clarity now on uh, which material should be combined with what materials. Um, but to give an example, maybe to say with the wine and spirits, which are usually um, sold in one way glass packaging. Um, here we need to make sure, I mean, we, 
weekends, the circularity would be to get the label back, but with the collection systems, it's, it's impossible. Once the bottle is in the container, uh, like they are in Germany, like how are we going to get the label back and it's going to be a mess because it's like mixed with all other labels on the, on the bottom and like everything else. Um, so, but what we can do and where we have control is to make sure that we use a label material and an adhesive that makes it possible for the label to slip off the bottle in these conditions. So these are like things we really are looking at. Um, our philosophy at CCL Label for the moment is that our labels and sleeves and what other decoration is uh, not hindering the recycling of the primary packaging because that's the most valuable and the most material that goes in there. So we really make sure that uh, the labels behave in recycling and that they have like built-in functionalities that make them easier to detach, watch off, um, don't lose any color, uh, inks and all that. Um, so that's like one of the main concerns. And then uh, the last pillar maybe is like um, circularity in production, uh, which we already have uh, implemented very much so. So, you know, just to put the waste materials back into the circle and all of that. So this is something that our um, plants are individually working at and which is already on a, on a very good path. So I think this is like for us because um, um, also, um, let's say education has become a big part. So CCI was never a company that used to take part in like uh, many uh, conferences or discussions uh, because we all, all, always saw it, you know, as like B2B, like, okay, we're going to like, you know, follow the brands and see what they want and everything. But um, I think um, our position has changed a lot to be um, also educating the brands or they want from us, they want to know, you know, what should we use? Like what is the best thing and all that. So it's shifted like a little bit and this is something that uh, we really put a focus on that we are able to support the goals of the brands <coughs> but are also able to, you know, educate consumers on um, that the packaging consists of different parts and a label is one part and it needs to do its job in the overall holistic picture. Thanks a lot. Um, I see that uh, basically when talking about circularity with you all, it's uh, in packaging it's critical um, for all of us. Uh, also for UPM Rafa, that can definitely it's one of the major topics and, and we'll be talking later on more about it as well. Uh, we are targeting to innovate on the packaging. We are targeting to remove the unnecessary packaging, but not too much, as, as somehow you said. It's about this balance that, uh, that you mentioned, Tobin. Um, we want to have the packaging that is reusable, that uh, it's recyclable, that uh, to some extent could be compostable. And, and definitely with all these uh, legislations, regulations and, and taxes that we have, uh, it's important how it starts, how the design for recycling starts. But obviously in design for recycling, everything starts with designers. And I would like to highlight to all our people how critical it's the role of designing and how critical is the role of the designers in this partnership with the brands. This part, how do you see then the approach to this uh, recyclability uh, when designing, when approaching with a brand? Well, uh, I would say we are not the most important part because if we don't have tools, Nothing is important about what we do, and the tools start in people like you, for example. Uh, we need uh, innovation teams of producers uh, doing their job or doing great job to offer new possibilities, new solutions, new materials. Uh, ma in when recycled materials started, they seem to be kind of craft materials, and it was interesting, but not appropriate for any project. Uh, later, we are moving in something that in which is as perfect as something that is not uh, recycled, but now we are even moving in and textures and things are appearing that are even more interesting than the normal one. Mm -hmm. That offers us a lot of opportunities to push the clients to move forward to do better things because everybody's interested in sustainability, but the first thing is that the project needs to, to be sustainable itself. The business needs sustainable to, to, be, to grow and to be, to be able to, to, to continue in, in, the, in the wheel. So, so for us, this sustainability thing is an holistic approach in which we need to select great partners that do great job and offer solutions and we are in the middle, we are linking the chain we, we are, because we are in the middle with the 
final uh, client and, and also the producer, and those material producer. And, and our main thing, I think, is to be updated about the possibilities that we have to create something that is as beautiful as expected, even more, and, and at the same time have these values that can be uh, on, on the project and, and helps the storytelling, helps the people to feel better what, with the job they are doing, helps the business to, to tell better things to the world and to make a better impact. So, so our, our main thing is to be linking those things. Uh, we are linkers. We connect ideas, we connect people, we connect solutions, and we are just connectors. But definitely, to be the linkers, you need to get uh, also from ourselves uh, more of that information that is sure. required about the innovations, Absolutely. about the materials, about the legislations that probably are far away from you. But on the standpoint, position Torbin of, of brand, and when you are thinking about uh, the changing in the packaging type, how you foresee the, the changes in the packaging to support recyclability? Yeah, well, uh, it taps a little bit into to the big challenge here, which we also face, and that's about collaboration. Uh, we, we need to establish completely new platforms of communication. Uh, we have uh, now got a whole new set of stakeholders in the chain, uh, which we need to uh, collaborate with and understand what is feasible. So I think when I started in the, a long time ago, it was not in my job description that I should wear boots and you know, walk around composting facilities to understand what's, what's that like, what's, what that's like. So we, are, we need to uh, do a lot of new collaborations here. Uh, recyclability is a big buzzword right now, uh, but I actually say recyclability is just the beginning. Uh, recyclability is something invented by the industry to kind of justify where we are. And uh, by recyclability, we can buy some time. Uh, but uh, when we look at food packaging material, uh, it will still be downgrading in most cases. So that's not the solution to the problem. And I expect that even for the well-defined countries where we have operations going on, it's a huge challenge. So what about those countries globally where they don't have collection schemes and waste handling systems? I think it's going to be uh, not the solution. Uh, we, we need to go even further. So we need to still look for new technologies and new ways of doing stuff. Um, I was very disappointed to see uh, a leak from the EU, com EU Commission uh, talking about a ban on compostable packaging, uh, because I actually think composting could be cool. a solution, especially for food packaging, where it, if it's done right, with the right facilities, actually is a plus-plus situation, a win-win situation. But um, that's a long way down the road there. <laughs> yeah, it's a long way. That's so, yeah. so in short, uh, new, new collaborations, new discussions, um, new networks, that must be a key word here. Yeah. And you surely collaborate a lot with the companies like uh, UPM Rough Attack. And, that's a new one, yes. <laughs> but that's uh, kind of the result of, of this learning. <laughs> yeah. But then uh, many of these questions uh, come to, to the printers uh, from the brands. And I'm, I'm really interested to understand from the past, looking back two years, today and, and look into the future, uh, how much of these uh, changes uh, in the inquiries, in the opportunities that you get with your customers uh, around the, the recyclability, around the demands for specific products uh, you have uh, received, uh, Marika? Okay, so let's start with looking back at the past. So I started three years ago and this job was newly created specifically because we had like a lot of customer inquiries and uh, we didn't really know, you know, what, 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 what that meant because customers um, had like very, let's say, different ideas of what sustainable labels are. Mm -hmm. So is it like CO2 reduced material? Is it compostable material? Is it uh, so material that works in existing recycling structures and all of that? So uh, this was something, uh, I think, um, to sum it up, I think there was like a lot of confusion in the beginning because you had the pressure of the NGOs 
and like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on all of this, you know, the, the, the pictures and like all the media are coming up and then everybody, you know, trying to like do the right thing. Um, but it wasn't like quite clear like where it was going because there was no legislation and nothing. So everybody mm. kind of like the industry scrambled to like do something. Yeah? And uh, so this is where we got like very conflicting, let's say, uh, questions from our customers, didn't really know what they wanted. We didn't really know what, what to offer. Mm. Um, so then, you know, we, we took a look at our portfolio and actually realized that, uh, and also, you know, with UPM, a lot of the products are already there. They just needed to be structured and communicated in a, in a new way um, so that, you know, um, there's more harmonization of the packaging materials. Because if you talk to recyclers, of course, they would want every package to be the same because for them it would be the easiest thing to, to, um, to then recycle it. So they want simplicity. They want, like, back to the roots, less packaging materials, uh, less decoration on it, and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is basically where we are at the moment. Everybody's waiting for legislation because uh, this is also something. So we see that we have like a lot of demand from for our packaging materials that are on the in the Rezi class design for recycling guidelines or approved by APR and all of that EPBP. I think that's something uh, that is pretty clear. Uh, PET recycling. Um, I, I live in Germany in Cologne and PET recycling in Germany has been a reality for many, many, many years. Um, you see every Saturday, you see people like uh, carrying like uh, all the empty bottles into the supermarket and feeding into one of those Tomra machines. And then, you know, you get your money back and you can redeem the coupon uh, at the cash register mm -hmm. to like buy something. So we have like a, a collection rate of 94% of PET oh. bottles, but only 37% of that are recycled back into new bottles. So mm. it's, it's a closed loop solution that already exists. Um, but it needs improvement and like one part of the solution for that could be to use the right labels because some You know some producers still put like paper labels on PET packaging and all of that because it like maybe looks more uh, Sustainable or because it's cheaper um, But uh, these are all things you know, these are all things we still see But I think the consolidation of the industry and also the knowledge is becoming a lot better and I think we already have like a lot of materials to offer. Sure. Um, could we do better? Yes, probably on the um, CO2 reduction of the packaging materials. Um, also maybe on some compostable solutions for the US, for example, where a lot is still landfilled. Um, and uh, also on, I think, on bio-based materials, that's something that needs to really be, be looked at. But otherwise, I think, also looking at the design for recycling guidelines that we already have a pretty good portfolio that we can offer. Thank you. I'm thinking on the role of the labels that you, you mentioned from this percentage of what goes to recycling in Germany and, and that we should use the right labels into the packaging and, and thinking from the future of packaging and the role of the labels in packaging. Um, Anna, I would like to, to ask from you uh, from the optimization of the packaging, from the use of more sustainable materials to those packagings. Uh, can you explain some of the elements that you are evaluating, that you are bringing, that would be critical for that future of packaging at uh, Sonai? Okay. For us, so we just developed our packaging menu that we will, for the own brand materials, where we have, we classify the products as red, amber, and green, the one, the green, free, free to use, Amber, there's, no, there's not still a solution in the market, but, so we can use it until we have a, a more sustainable or green solution and red, the ones that we completely forbid for, from our own brand. So in, as a summary, we are privileging the mono materials. Mm -hmm. We are privileging the, um, uh, the, to inc incorporate the recycled content into the, the product. We also are working on as we said, it's important also to communicate to the, cust to the consumer for them to know where to, uh, where is the cycle of the, and where to put the, yes. the, the packaging materials. And um, so, and regarding the, um, what you ask, the, important, the importance of the retailers, of course, we can push the market. Of course, we have a, a big uh, role in pushing the suppliers and the producers 
to uh, present to the consumer more sustainable solutions, and mm -hmm. that's what we are we are we are working on, and also to um, it's basically the three R's: to reduce, reuse, and uh, privilege the recyclability, and to use reusable uh, packaging also. Okay, good fact about the reusable. And Anna. just w one yes, important please. thing is that we also privilege to uh, build strong partnerships with our uh, packaging suppliers and with our uh, uh, food suppliers and product suppliers so, so that we know what's the new state of art, new solutions, so that we can push and also learn from one category to the others and mm. to present every um, time more sustainable solutions in terms of packaging and of course always working on reducing until the maximum limit. Yes. Uh, um, reducing thicknesses, reducing uh, the, the sizes, adapting every more to the product that we have, avoiding to transport also air. It's not sustainable and it's not profitable. So. Yeah. And obviously balancing again, yeah. as, as Tobin mentioned before, between the, the different targets. I'll continue on the reusing uh, because obviously I'm sure that on the reusable packaging and you mentioned before Ursula from the drinks industry and, and I have to admit I still remember to be back with bottles of glass of some drinks to retailers when I was really a kid because I think that at home my mother said that now you go to the retailer and bring them back and if you get money, it's for you. So <laughs> I remember that well. What comes to the reusable packaging and, and I would like to understand more because I think it's very critical, especially in the drinks industry. What's your, your stand position on that area and what are the future packaging innovations that we could see linked to reusable? Absolutely. So. Uh, just to build on what Anna was saying about reducing one big, bold decision that Diageo took about a year ago and we executed globally was the elimina complete elimination of boxes. It was called Project Oxygen. I was removing all the boxes from every single um, bottle of uh, what we call premium core. That will include things like JMB, Tanqueray, Smirnoff, Captain Morgan, um, Johnny Walker red and black label. So all the boxes around the world behind these were fully eliminated. So that, that's a reduction example. Um, I, I talk in a second about, about recyclability and, and, and circularity and, and how we're making progress there. But one, one very um, important word that is coming to my mind, listening to all my peers on the panel, is the collaboration. I think the role that, that companies like, like yours in partnership with companies like ours and with everyone, it's really going to be the enable. One of the things that I think I'm really enjoying just most of sitting here is I've worked with Maba in the past. I know we source from, from you guys. We work with Sonai to sell, sell our products, but I think just sitting here, the, the visibility that I'm getting from the different angles, it's the, I think it's this collaboration what's really going to unlock the future. And I would want to use this space to encourage all of us, and, and starting with you, to help us drive with your technical knowledge uh, that journey ahead. But we, we need to count on you because we can have the best intentions. But if we don't know what's available, of, as, as Bea was saying, in terms of the the tools, the, the elements, as Marika was saying, all the, the, all the different um, solutions we may have and all those pioneering, whether it's because you're, you're, you're driving that innovation, I think that's going to be fundamental. So big invitation, I think, from companies like, like ours to help us drive that journey ahead. So obviously we are all very aware. I mean, these conversations were not happening 10 years ago, maybe not even five years ago. So it's, it, we, I think we're on that journey of collaboration, I, which is fantastic. I think we are all learning what is it that, that we are going to be able to do, what we can do. So in, in defining the future, which was your, your question, um, I think we are really trying to learn from many different things. So I'm going to give you 
some examples of the type of things around recyc recyclability and other things that we're trying to drive at the Agio. And there are so many open projects with very specific targets and fast learning prog uh, projects on their agile methodologies. Uh, that I, I mean, I cannot tell you about all of them because it would, the list is gigantic and it's, some are driven by specific countries, some are driven by specific global brands. But just to name a few, um, we are heavily investigating how could we partner with governments to drive in, in many countries better recyclable um, techniques, particularly with, with bars and, and, uh, and on trade um, venues. So getting into that circularity for glass, it's going to be very important. And for us, of course, glass, it's transparent glass and green glass and brown glass, and it has its own, its own uh, requirements for processing. Uh, there are countries, I've, I've had the pleasure of living in, in Switzerland for, for quite a while, and the, obviously the culture of recycling in Switzerland, if anyone here lives there or has ever visited, you understand, yeah, you understand that glass goes into different containers on different days of the week at specific times so you don't make noise for your neighbors, yes. So it's, it's a massive culture of how and when and why and how, and, and that's already in progress, right? I mean, there are countries like, like Latin America where the mindset is not even there, no? So the, 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 we have a journey ahead yes. in educating consumers, in partnering with governments. Again, the key word here is collaboration, and it's not about us and the competition, it's about everyone together and the Coca-Colas of the world and, and how everyone is going to, to bring this together. So th those are conversations that we're having. And then we have actual projects. So for example, we have, we have a project called um, Eco Spirits. Uh, we partner with a company called Eco Spirits and we are running tests mainly in Asia. These are solutions to bring um, bigger volumes of liquid to the on trade. In, in different con type of containers. These ones are called totes. I don't know why, because it's more of a bag in box, if you will. But uh, it's a new solution to deliver to consumers or to, to, to bar owners. Interestingly, when we talk about wines and spirits and beverages, particularly when they are alcoholic, the reality is that these are products that consumers don't need. It's things that consumers want, and they want them for a full experience. So compromising on, on the experience, it's, it's very hard. We go yes. back to that idea of people and performance and, uh, and how do we put everything together yes. you know, and, and link to purpose. So I think we need to be very careful. So for example, we have those totes and, and that seems to be working really well as a solution. Uh, but then when it gets to scalability, it gets harder because yes. how do you uh, gather everything back and so it's tricky. We have another one called Pro, um, Bottle for Life. Bottle for Life is just a beautiful Johnny Walker bottle that has been designed in ceramic. Um, it, it's a very beautiful bottle. That The idea is that people buy a, a refill container okay. to pour back in. So this has been tested in Spain. It might be, get um, rolled out. But the reality is that you need at least a consumer to buy five times the refill before it becomes actually uh, positive. So it requires, again, a lot of education, a lot of collaboration, a lot of commitment from the consumer, um, and five bottles of whiskey, <laughs> unless you're having a party and then you need them all at the same time, it's, it's a long journey because the frequency of our products is not that high. No? So that's another challenge. And then another example I wanted to give you is an actual, actually a complete different material or project. It's, it's a project that, that has been highly um, publicized in, in the trade media, it's called mm -hmm. Project Pulp. Pulp is about the Johnny Walker bottle made out of, um, of, of paper. It's, I'm sure it has a lot of technicalities going in and varnishes and things, I don't know about them, but it's, it's a major project that, that the company is working against. I guess for me, the one thing to rescue, one is obviously that, that collaboration, but what makes me very happy is to see companies like ours like many others, that are no longer just looking at the tiny brand that nobody cares about to test something. I mean, when you're talking of the biggest brands of the company, in our case, it's Guinness and Johnny Walker, being the ones testing and driving and thinking and partnering, I think that's what's really going to unlock the growth. So it's collaboration, which was the first one that I mentioned, and scale, on mm. the other hand. And I think those two together is what's going to help us drive Absolutely. that.
Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm happy to listen that you go to big brands because the bigger the brand, the bigger the volume for us. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really important for, for everyone. Us. The bigger Absolutely. the volume for everyone. Yeah, yeah. No, and to make the change happen, you need to make a, scale, a scalable change, uh, otherwise it, uh, it will not happen. So we need to drive the change. I'll change a little bit to the a subject that we have discussed, in fact, uh, some months ago with uh, Beatriz and, and Miguel Angel. And I'm sure that you have seen probably in, in news, in magazines, about uh, label-less, and that's uh, making me feel bad, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> label-less. How does it go that we can start getting packaging with a QR code, packaging with um, uh, only a sign? Uh, what, what do you think about this from the designer perspective? In your opinion, from a designer perspective, from the future of packaging, are we going to really get to a moment where there is label less, there is no label in the packagings of the different items? I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. C cinema baby. <laughs> not uh, no, I, I want to. I, I think that uh, a QR can replace a, a label, no? the experience of a label, the storytelling of a label, the beauty of a label, the differentiation of a label in a border. No? But I think that can, a QR can improve the, the experience to buy a, a bottle of wine, for example. Yeah. No? Maybe in the future with our glasses you can um, walk, uh, throw the vineyard, talk with the, with the, with the wineries, and. And, and make a better decision to, to buy a, a bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. But I think that the future, maybe there are a lot of solutions, not only labels, but, but, but a, a world without labels. Like, mm -hmm. like Good to hear, <laughs> and I'm sure that <laughs> the audience is happy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I, have, I have to say that uh, by the end of the day, we are very visual animals. Uh, yes. And so it's true that this new reality is coming and, and, and coming more and more. But, uh, but we are visual animals. In fact, we are not prepared to buy online. When you do the online shop, uh, I mean with the food, for example, to a supermarket, they don't put you just the name of the brand and the capacity and you buy it. You need to see the bottle, even if, you, if it's online. And it's a bottle of maybe soap or, you know, or something that is not important, but you need to see the bottle. If not, uh, you are not feeling comfortable mm. with that, that process. And uh, the point is that the human brain is able to recognize 10,000 of brands. We don't wow. buy products, we, bra we buy brands. It happened. Uh, it's impossible for me to remind the chemical period elements board that we <laughs> studied when we were younger that were for sure, I don't know how many, but 20, 30, but, but I recognize 10,000 of brands. So it's, it's part of our culture, it's part of our life, it's the way we uh, recognize the world and we are able to socialize with the world itself. It's, yeah. it's a reality. So. Most of brands, the only opportunity they have to, to, to start a, a dialogue with someone is the label for most of brands. Mm. Even for brands that are huge, but I go to the bar and I see the bottle and that, that's my bottle, I can recognize it. Uh, mm. So even if it's a huge brand that uh, appears on many places, I see the bottle and I know that this is mine and, and it is what we do. So I think in the meantime, we are still humans. Labels will be there yes. uh, for most of the things. Yes. Um, and it's the added value for the, for the product that we are consuming. Absolutely. The brand supporting that. And, and the brand needs to talk with the consumer. Well, you said 10,000 brands. Yeah, it's really, it's I amazing. Mean, it's huge. I don't know if I recognize 10,000 brands. Yeah. Probably my husband would say differently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, but for sure, it's yeah. a huge it number. Seems to be crazy, but it's real. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, no, I trust. Uh, right. I studied, my first degree was uh, psychology, and later we added design and neuromarketing. And when I read about this quantity, it was, really? Really? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I started to think, and if you start to think step by step, you you can recognize many, many, many of them. Yes, and, true. And yeah. So that is part of our brain and our life and the way we do things. So 
But you refer, and, and obviously, uh, with the Studio Mava, with Beatriz and Miguel Angel, we work uh, as well. We collaborate a lot into the end use responsibility for Stefano, Carlos, and myself on the wine, spirits, and beverage. It's a secret, it's a secret. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, when talking about food and thinking about my consumer experience in the food, um, you said about recognizing the product. Obviously, when I buy meat, when I buy cheese, I recognize the cheese. I mean, I, how much from the perspective of the label less, so no label in the food industry, what are that aspect that you think that, uh, and I hope uh, you say that no, there is no label less, <laughs> what is the aspect that will keep labels to continue in the food industry in, in your specific end use? Um, two things. Um, First of all, I think I will tap into a discussion also about uh, the chains because what I see when we talk about finding sustainable packaging solutions, we often see, or more and more often see, that the current packaging lines cannot provide the solutions. So we need to change technology. Um, and uh, so where we use labels today, we may not need them tomorrow or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, but also it comes with a cost. It comes with a huge cost, uh, and I think we, as a brand owner, are willing to, to work with that cost, but we cannot carry it alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we will also try to get our consumers to take a part of it. Um, also to understand the complexity, uh, in certain areas of our business, we have like 50% of production to private label customers. Uh, so that's also just to understand that we can have an opinion on our own brands, but it's very, very difficult to have an opinion on the, the mm. private label customers. Mm. And we see them uh, shifting a lot back and forth. Uh, you know, when it's without commitment, they want a lot. Yes. <laughs> when it's with commitment, maybe not. Um, okay, so that's to explain that sometimes we have to look into new packaging solutions. And I mentioned also compostability before. Yes. So I see a world with, with, with labels and without labels. Uh -huh. um, as I said, we use an awful lot of labels in many, many applications, I mean, all over the place, and that I expect will continue. Uh, there's a need for labels, for all kinds of labels. But we also see new solutions where a label will not really fit in. So if I have like a compostable packaging, I would not really need a label, I think. Okay. Uh, if I could avoid it. I mean, if it's like a fiber pouch, yes. why would I need a paper label on a fiber pouch? Uh, so. There could be some new products coming up there where we have to think differently. Hmm. But I understand that in the balance of plus and minus, no label and adding labels of continuity. You will still be in the game. I'm I hope that we sure. are on a neutral <laughs> of a similar volume, especially yeah. from the perspective of, of the business of, of our well, companies. Let me give you another example. Uh, I have a case right now in the Middle East. Uh, we have a big operation in Bahrain and, mm -hmm. uh, where we produce uh, cream cheese or processed cheese. Uh, that's uh, like an iconic brand down there, yeah. the POC, and it's uh, produced in glass jars. Now, there's absolutely no recycling in the Middle East. Okay. Uh, I think maybe some tires somewhere, <laughs> but most of it is just put to landfill. And I read an article that um, a prince, I can't remember his name, in, uh, in 10 years' time will have, uh, was it 95% of all, all materials recycled in the region. Wow. So that's, that's how it happens. <laughs> but at this point, I'm asked, uh, how do we make packaging, a bit, how do we make a better footprint in the Middle East? Exactly. Because all this glass is very heavy. It's, uh, it's a massive CO2 footprint. So I'm asked, can't we just swap to, to PET bottles instead, or jars? Because that's a much lower weight and, you know. But I'm actually in a situation where I can't decide right now because it will all depend on what kind of system that's put in place. If it's a glass system that comes in first, it will be wise to stay in glass. Yes. If they start pet recycling, yes. maybe we should use a swap. So. so that's why it's so hard at this point to actually give clear directions. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but surely there are shifts towards changing packaging types and, and sort of labels that we will use at uh, Sonai from retailer perspective also the changes and the shift towards uh, movements to, to support the recyclability, sustainability, and any label less. <laughs> okay, so we need to separate the, the, where we use labels. 
So in terms of the product itself that we supply to the consumer, we cannot live without labels. Mm -hmm. So we don't sell a steak, we sell or a protein. We sell the food experience. Good. <laughs> so we need, it's the way that we communicate the solution. And without the label, it's just a red dot inside of the tray. <laughs> <laughs> so for that, we will continue, of course, using more sustainable materials, reducing and communicating better, and also regarding the certifications, the sustainability, and to communicate to consumer, we need to communicate where? In a label. Yes. So those will not disappear, will be more sustainable. We have other, op uh, where do we use more labels? Into secondary packaging, into pallets. Yes. That will be the trend to reduce, to minimize, and even to disappear, to, to replace by digital. That we can do. But on primary packaging, where we need to continue communicating, and we will need to continue using labels. And for instance, we have several initiatives regarding refill. We okay. have refill stations in the stores where consumers can go and refill or either the chemicals or the, the beans, things with, low, with a high shelf life. And it's not, uh, it doesn't have a, a big expression now. Consumers are not um, really uh, using this solution. No? And what we expect is because of <coughs> convenience. You need to go to the supermarket with a big basket of several containers, and it's not uh, convenient for consumers. Mm -hmm. What we are um, seeing that is increasing in expression, it's the pouches. The refill okay. pouches that we spoke yesterday are not the in terms of reducing uh, the consume of packaging are good, but in terms of recyclability and sustainability overall, they are not, uh, we have still that difficulty. Mm. Um, and also, why do we will continue to, to, do la to use labels? Regarding, we, we are forgetting one thing that is shelf life of a product. Yes. If we use bulk, the shelf life is the 24 hours and the ones that the consumer re is responsible by at home. If we want to have shelf life of a product, it needs to be in a packaging that is supplied by the producer, where it has his responsibility until the end of the shelf life. And we will always need to use labels to communicate, and even legal aspects that we need to communicate to the consumers, ingredients, nutritionals. Yes. So. The functional part of, of yeah. the packaging. Yeah, so for us, it's more sustainability on packaging, uh, mm. primary packaging labels, and then uh, for the others to search for uh, uh, online solutions, digital mm. solutions. But so to continue. Can I, can I, I, can I weigh Go. in on this? Yes. Okay, I'm going to be maybe disruptive and maybe a, a thought provoker. Go can I provoke. Go? Okay. <laughs> So um, I know we're talking labels, right? And, and I think we love our labels here in this, in this room. Fantastic. But I'm going to be maybe a little bit thought provoking. When, when I think as a consumer, and again, representing the voice of the consumer in the room, I think that the bare minimum is that a label offers me information. Yes. All the information on, on expiration date, where it's made, the, I mean, a lot of information. Great. I think there is a second level, which is about an experience that I get from a label. Absolutely. It's what, how does it make my product and experience better in what it means. And I'll give you an example that it's evident in a second, in, at least in my case. And the third is it's so related to the experience that it becomes part of the brand iconicity. Yes. So I, I think one of the best examples, and I invite you to use it, is the Johnny Walker one, because the angle as, uh, where it is positioned, the materials, I mean, the Johnny Walker label, it, I don't think Johnny Walker could exist without a label, genuinely, because it's, it's at a certain angle, it's recognized worldwide, and just that placement of a label in a, in a square bottle, in a world of round bottles, it's what makes part of the brand experience so memorable, so critical, so recognizable, and everybody loves it, and, and it is what it is. And the label is part of that experience, yes. right? Now, if I go to the other side, it's, I, I'm going to use another example of my, my, and I'm going mentally through all the things that I have in my portfolio, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I really think that our um, vodka called Siroc doesn't have labels, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's, uh, gosh, I, I should know these things, I'm sorry. But going mentally through it, I, I think it's a beautiful product that has a, a dot at the oh, top yes. of the bottle yes. that it's made out of the same glass, and it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. And it's, it's I think it's serigraphy, I don't, I don't know how it's made, or inkjet printed, something. Yeah. But it's an alternative, and it's delivering on the same for consumers, right? Yes. So I'm not saying labels are gonna go away, but, this is the thought-provoking part. 
If you think about why Netflix thrived and Blockbuster died, or why, I mean, we can go into many, many examples of companies that didn't anticipate the future. The reality is that you could print, I'm going to go extreme right now. You could print a QR code, because now every single person in the world has a mobile phone. And you could, consumers could do like this, and they could have a 3D interpretation of what that product is, including the expiration date, and, and maybe labels become replaceable with so much, something much more exciting, engaging, dynamic, changeable from the background so you don't yes. need to replace it. So again, I'm being thought provoking because I think it would be very convenient to say, yeah, labels are here to stay forever. Maybe yes, the next 10 years, but technology is fast advancing. So maybe my challenge to you is on one side, when you work on labels, how do you make them? And I think you make them, but even more about the entire experience, about that iconicity. So it's not replaceable, like in a Johnny Walker, but then if the label, it's not going to be needed because there is a QR code that you do like this and amazing things appear on your phone. 3D, how it was made, which cow the milk came from. And uh, you can see the entire chain there, right? Because that, that, that exists. How, how are you going to get into that business? So again, very thought provoking, but either you make them super iconic or you need to diversify. And, and I like the provocation, uh, even that obviously not the business targets that I might have next year, but, uh, uh, but, but hey, it's, a fair, it's, it's a fair point. And I'm thinking while you were talking, I was thinking of my, of my sons. Uh, definitely the way they get engaged with the materials, with the brands, my son has three hands, the two and the mobile. <laughs> then uh, the QR code for him might be something that it's standard. And we don't know how it will evolve for sure. But I hope that, Marika, you have another point of view. <laughs> because otherwise, our businesses will be ruined. I'm going to leave immediately. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody's show. depressed. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, well, it's one of my favorite questions, because Thank I usually you. do like a media research in the morning. And if I like see something was brought out by a brand with like no label, I know I'm going to get like 500 emails that day from my colleagues you know, all complaining that it's the end of the world, like we can close <laughs> all our facilities, um, all of that. So, um, so we've done a lot of work talking to everybody involved with like these no-label projects. Yes. And uh, I mean, I must admit, the design uh, looks like great on some of the beer bottles and stuff like that. And like the latest discussion uh, we had was about a, a wine bottle that was launched, I think, in Australia. And it was like just a naked bottle and it had like a QR code on the top. And it received like a lot of media attention. And uh, I, I asked, you know, my colleagues in like the wine and spirits printing facilities, like what they thought of it. And of course, they all like had a near heart attack because they also say that's not possible because wine is passion. And the label transports passion. And if yes. you don't know a lot about wine you buy because you like the label especially if you're buying wine in france where you don't yes. even know you know like chateau this chateau that you don't even, <laughs> they don't they don't even give you like the you know you don't they don't name the grape because you assume to like know which region grows which grape and so you know this is like something and i love wine and spirits labels i think they're like amongst the most beautiful ones and also the most challenging for us to print um, and I think just to bring this aspect in, uh, you can also adjust a lot in the printing technologies to make it more sustainable. So instead, you know, if you come to like the, the metallic effects and everything, you can use different printing technologies to make it like more or less sustainable. You can use digital printing, you know, to do all of that. And um, I think um, for that, this is like one aspect, the, the, the whole, uh, let's say, emotional experience. Yes. Um, then we talk to, I mean, first of all, to make these, let's stay with like a, a PET bottle mm -hmm. um, that has no label on it, but it has like all the information on it. Uh, first of all, you can hardly read it if you don't have orange juice in it, for example. If you yes. don't have the filling in it, it's like very hard to read. And as you know, there's like a change in like legislation, what you have to put on there, which symbols, blah, 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 like every five minutes. So that's why you always have to change the form. And that's yes. very, very expensive. So that's like one aspect of the whole thing. And then like the third example I, I like very much is like uh, imagine Coca-Cola. So you have like Coca-Cola, you have like Diet Coke, uh, 
uh, normal Coca-Cola, cherry Coke, they all look the same. So nobody, you know, you will just have like three brown bottles next to each other without the iconic red color and nobody will really know. Of course you can like, you know, scan it and then you know, aha, I have this, but it's, it's, it's not the same experience and I think sales would really go down. I don't think the brands would, would like that in the end. Uh, so that's like one aspect. It's different with the cheese, as you say, you see the cheese and you, you know, kind of, if you know cheeses, um, that's like fine. Um, but I think, I, I really think that's like part, and of course you can do direct printing as well, but then you also have to think about the recyclability because uh, then the, you know, the sorting system can't see through the glass if, if they can't get the color off. So direct printing uh, works on some, on some things, yes. Um, and last but not least, because you talked about connected packaging is what we call it, this like the brand experience. And I agree with you that uh, we haven't like advanced as much as I thought, and I thought it would advance more mm -hmm. during the pandemic when you know brands weren't able to interact mm -hmm. with like consumers in the supermarket, I thought we would have like more things happening on the connected packaging and interactive um, sphere. Um, and that can be transported through different things. Direct printing QR codes and labels. Because then you can individualize a little bit more if you print it in digital to printing, you know you can really like uh, personalize um, all the packaging. So I think a mixture in the end, and as, as, as you pointed out before, a mixture is what it's going to be. Um, I think some articles are going to be without a label and they look beautiful and it's fine, it's a niche product. And then uh, just like the, you know, these um, stores that opened up that don't have any packaging at all, where you like go with all of your things. And, and you know, people were like really upset about them in the beginning, you know, like, oh, the supermarket's going to die, packaging is going to die. But it's, it's a niche because, and that's fine. Yeah. You know, you need like something for everybody. We are a society that consumes in different ways and is used to like, you know, as I want it. Um, so I, I think everybody can coexist very peacefully. Good to hear. Uh, Torvin. <laughs> we can breathe again. <laughs> you wanted to still comment on, uh, on yes, the topic? Yes. Uh, actually, I would like to say that Please. to me, it's not a question about label or not label. And I think it's important to take away here because we're in a situation where we have to change our mindsets and we have to remember the purpose of the product. The purpose of the product, if we are not careful, will remain selling more products. But with the changing mindset, the new purpose is including the packaging end of life. And uh, you have to learn that as well so you can help us get those uh, solutions in place because we will be forced to, to do that. Mm. If not by consumers, then by legislation, yes. but it will come. So please remember that as a, as a takeaway today. Thank you. And just great comments, great insights. I'm, I'm hoping that you all got inspired by, by our speakers. I'd like to take, at least from my side, two outcomes that um, I believe they have been outstanding. First of all, collaboration. And collaboration means that we need to collaborate in the industry with the different partners, with the different stakeholders for the full ecosystem. The second one that I take, and I take uh, Anna's words, purpose. We all have a purpose. We can make this purpose to happen. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, with companies and, and leaders like the ones we have here sitting with us, we will make it happen. A big thank you. I'm really grateful for having you here today, and uh, I hope that you also enjoyed the, the discussion together with us. Big applause for our speakers. <laughs> <laughs>